Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger and dressed yourself and went where you were wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, contain teachings of Jesus. And then as we've seen during this sermon series for the last um, six sermons, this being the seventh, as well as last week when Paul brought a yet another story of Jesus, they contain stories. Of Jesus, And I thank Paul for bringing the message last week while Barb and I were visiting family and friends in Asheville as she went to her high school reunion. And many times we focus, particularly in sermons, on the teachings of Jesus and less frequently on the stories of Jesus. But the stories are included in Scripture for a number of reasons. They provide us with living examples of Christ's teaching in action, of Jesus putting his words into practice. We might say practicing what he preached. Stories of Jesus also, very much as we'll see in today's sermon serve as illustrations to us of God's power, of God's authority, 
of God's grace and God's compassion and how it can impact us. For it is through story that we can bring Jesus' teaching to life and bring it home to us. Today's sermon, as I mentioned, the final one in this series on stories of Jesus takes a look at the last recorded story about Jesus in our New Testament. It's the final chapter of John. And we see it being a nice wrap-up to the book of John. For John wrote really for two primary purposes in his gospel. Each gospel writer had a collection of stories that either they heard or had witnessed about Jesus, and they had Jesus' teaching, and then they brought their knowledge and their stories and teachings together for a specific audience, a specific purpose, a specific point or points that they wanted to illustrate and make about Jesus. John's message that recurs throughout his gospel and we should keep in the back of our mind today as we listen to this story is twofold. First of all, Jesus is God. John's gospel starts, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. And we know that the Word is Jesus Christ, through whom nothing that was made was made or without whom nothing was made. Everything was made through Jesus. He was present at the beginning with God because he is God. And the second big theme of John's gospel is that God came to earth in human form. We call it the incarnation. The word became flesh, became incarnate, became human, and lived among us as that living example that I spoke of earlier. And so we are looking at stories about Jesus today, the last recorded story about Jesus. Depending on how you sort through things, it may or may not be the last story we actually have of Jesus on a chronological basis, but John is the last gospel. This is the last chapter of John, so it's the final recorded story story that we have in the Gospels. John wrote his Gospel so that we can believe. Specifically, as the writer tells us in John 20, verse 31. That's the verse right before Barb began reading today. John tells us, but these are written, that being the first 20 chapters of John, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Messiah, God's chosen one, the one who brings God's kingdom to earth. Not as a political ruler, but as a servant leader who brings God's kingdom through sacrifice. God's chosen one. And then the Son of God. The Son of God's a concept that's very well known by people in the Near East and Jews of Jesus' day. And sometimes it's literally believed to be someone who is begat or birthed by a deity, a god. Other times it's someone with a special relationship. But in Jesus' case, we know particularly from, again, John's gospel and the way he talks about God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, the word being one, being united, Son of God is professing the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God. So verse 31 of chapter 20 would be the perfect wrap-up to John's gospel. 
All of this has been written so that she can believe Jesus is God and Jesus came to earth as a human being, as God's chosen one to bring God's kingdom to earth. But the story doesn't end there. There's debate among big biblical scholars as to whether or not chapter 21 is a later add-on to the gospel, whether it was even written by the same author as the rest, or if it was some editor's wrap-up. And it really does not matter. We know that the ultimate author of Scripture is God. But what is good for us to realize is that it is a good epilogue. Or when I read it, I thought of encore. You have a concert where all of the stories and all of the pictures and all of the songs are sung and performed in the first 20 verses or chapters of John. And then in chapter 21, after the closing applause, after the final words are spoken. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Son of God. The band comes back out. And the very best encore performances really rock the house. They bring everything together. They bring back and relive and allow the audience to relive and reinforce the concert and the message of the concert. That, I think, is John chapter 21. For we see that John has written so that we can believe. Yet Jesus' story doesn't end there. Jesus' story continues. As I look around the congregation today, most of you know that I am a big baseball fan. I played it when I was younger, not necessarily real well, but I enjoyed it. Took advantage of the beauty of baseball that everyone from the greatest professional to the clumby, clumsiest playground kid can play the game and enjoy it and have fun. And I've been a lifelong Braves fan and have season tickets to this day to the Braves. And one of my favorite baseball characters, one whom I enjoy quoting in presentations, I'm not sure I've ever quoted him in a sermon before today. I did preach a baseball sermon many years ago uh, that maybe I had some Yogi Berra in. But today's sermon is an homage to Yogi Berra. Hall of Fame catcher for the New York Yankees who passed away a few years ago. A couple of things that maybe you've heard about Yogi saying is, it ain't over till it's over. Perhaps the best thing he ever said is, I never said most of the things I said. Let that one sink in for a minute. I never said most of the things I said. But one of the things that he said that he didn't say is it's like deja vu all over again. And that's again chapter 21 of John's Gospel. For the disciples and especially for us as John's audience, as the readers... It's like deja vu all over again. It's that encore bringing back aspects of the previous performance and reinforcing the truths that we've already heard. And in our story today, I count four, maybe five deja vu moments in the story. The story starts with seven of Jesus' disciples gathered together. Peter, the man of action, says, I'm going fishing. Now remember, Peter and at least three other disciples' profession before Jesus called them was fishing. So this isn't just let's go 
have a recreational time of fishing. He's saying, let's return to what we know very well. I'm going fishing. And the other six said, fine, we're going with you. So they all went out to the Sea of Galilee on their boat, and they kept casting their nets all night, and they caught nothing. The deja vu moment is, one of the first encounters many of those disciples had with Jesus was, guess what? In a boat, on the Sea of Galilee, after they'd been fishing all night long and not caught a thing. And just like in the first version, the first iteration of the story, Jesus is standing on shore, and here he says, Children, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we've caught nothing. And he says, well, take your net and throw it on the other side of the boat, on the left, right side of the boat, and you'll catch something. And they did, and they did. We know it was a huge catch. The writer tells us 153 big fish that they caught. And... The disciple whom Jesus loved, we believe to be the author of the gospel, to be John, recognized Jesus' term of endearment children and saw the power of his words in the catch and said, It is the Lord. Peter, the man of action, jumps out of the boat, swims to shore, runs to shore. They weren't that far out to meet his Lord Jesus Christ. So we have deja vu moment number one where Jesus provides a miraculous catch. In fact, what's ironic and I believe important for us to remember is that although the disciples were professional fishermen in the Gospels, they never catch a single fish without Jesus' help. Get that. They never catch a single fish without Jesus' help. That's a miraculous story. It teaches us that we need Jesus' help to do anything, to include our occupation in our daily lives. But there's some metaphorical truth to that too, and we'll get to that in a couple of moments. Well, after Peter runs to shore, and Jesus asks... All of the disciples, did you catch anything? And they said, yes. And Peter runs out and helps them bring the catch to the shore. And Jesus says, bring me some of the fish you caught. And they notice as they bring fish to Jesus that there's already a fire prepared. And over that fire, Jesus is cooking fish and bread. And Jesus invites them, come have some breakfast. Deja vu, moment number two, maybe even number three, depending on how you want to count it. Jesus and the miraculous catch and the... and fish. Can you think of a miracle involving bread and fish? the feeding of the multitudes, the 5,000 and the 4,000, where Jesus took loaves, bread, and fish, and fed many. Here, he's feeding his disciples, his followers. Not necessarily in a miraculous way, but Jesus is feeding them. Notice, too, who is doing the serving. And that's maybe the third deja vu moment is just a week or so earlier, certainly a few weeks at the most, Jesus was having dinner serving his disciples the night he was betrayed. In what we know and will celebrate today as communion, the Last Supper. 
But you see, this deja vu moment, this encore performance, if you will, assures us that Jesus serving the disciples and washing their feet and feeding them wasn't a one-time or a final event Jesus still feeds today. The resurrected Christ empowers his disciples to have miraculous catches and he feeds them and allows them to serve. That's a message for us today. And the story continues that after they had breakfast, Jesus calls Peter over and famously asks him three times, Jesus, do you love me? Three times Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you. And three times Jesus responds with words to the effect, care for my sheep. Many sermons are preached just on that text, and, and there's a lot of richness that perhaps we can bring out there, but the important thing for our message today, the deja vu moment is, Peter's got to be thinking, my goodness, I betrayed Jesus by denying him three times. But Jesus loves Peter so much that Jesus calls Peter over personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and does what? Ask him, first of all, do you love me? And when Peter responds, yes, I do, Jesus does what? Gives him a job. Jesus calls Peter into service. If we love God, our proper response is to respond to God's call to serve. In fact, if you look at this story to this point, it's all about service. It's all about Jesus providing miraculous catch for his disciples as they seek to do their work. It's all about Jesus serving bread and fish, breakfast to his disciples, and now it's about Jesus calling and rehabilitating flawed Peter saying, Peter, I love you. Peter, you're good enough. Peter, I want you to be shepherd to my sheep while I'm gone. What a message. Jesus' story continues, and Jesus calls flawed persons. I mentioned earlier in talking about the miraculous catch that perhaps there's a metaphorical meaning for us as well in this. Remember, if you think back to that first encounter of Jesus and the disciples, it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, where they had fished all night and not caught anything, and Jesus said, cast your net on the other side of the boat, and you will, and they did, and they did, so much in that case that the nets were bursting, but when it is over, how did the disciples, that being Peter and Andrew, James and John, respond? They left everything and followed Jesus. Jesus said, you will be fishers of people. Now, in this encore performance... The writer perhaps is taking these stories about Jesus and is using this last story to wrap up Jesus' reminder that we are to be fishers of people. And we can't catch people by ourselves. We can't serve others outside this sanctuary by ourselves. We just don't have the capacity to do it, but we know the one who does. And Jesus stands to work miracles today and to give us a miraculous catch. If you say, Si, maybe you're stretching it a little too far. I think the metaphorical points tie up pretty well. But remember, Jesus asked something peculiar. He has this fire with fish and bread already cooking, and before he invites the disciples to eat breakfast, he says, bring me some fish. Did that strike you funny? Why is Jesus asking for fish when he's already got 
breakfast prepared. That word bring that we translate is the same root word in the original language as what is translated in other contexts as bear. Jesus says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. With me you can do everything. You can bear fruit. Bring that fruit. Bring those fish. Bring those people that you are fishermen's of to me. Because also notice the story the disciples bring the fish to Jesus and the fish disappear. They're no longer part of the story. It's simply Jesus saying, bear fruit. In my power, you have caught fish. Bring them to me. Bring your harvest, bring your fruits to me as Jesus. So the message for us today is that Jesus still feeds Jesus still empowers us as his people. And one last deja vu moment, and with this I'll leave us. Jesus does this. Jesus feeds us. Jesus empowers us. Jesus calls us as flawed people, even when we don't see Jesus at work. The last deja vu moment is remember the disciples in the boat having caught nothing and this dude on the shore says, have you caught anything? Throw your net on the other side. They don't know who Jesus is. The same way that Mary didn't initially recognize Jesus at the tomb, the same way that the two disciples on the road to Emmaus walked a great distance and didn't recognize Jesus. You see, even the disciples, after having seen the risen Lord, they didn't recognize him at first. Comfort to us that we don't always recognize God when he's at work. But that doesn't keep God from working. The message for us today is that Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us to tend his sheep. Jesus calls us to bring persons to him, but it reminds us that on our own it won't work. We can try and try and try and toil and toil and toil all night and we will get nothing. But listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus on the shore even when we don't recognize him initially through the mist and the haze. And when we do, there's nothing that we cannot accomplish. What projects have you been laboring over and seem to be getting nowhere? Look for the light. Look for Jesus. The risen Jesus is in the life-changing business. He's calling us to be part of that life-changing business. How does God want to change your life today? Look for Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Obey him and live for him. Let's pray. Father God, Creator God, Jesus, our Lord, we come to you today. We acknowledge that without you we can do nothing, and we thank you that with you there's nothing that we cannot do. Help us to remember your stories your stories recorded in scripture and your stories recorded in our hearts and minds of your actions in our life. Remind us to look to you when we seem to be failing. To remember that even when we let you down, you still love us, you still call us, 
you still find us worthy to be your servant. Help us to serve as the greatest servant of all Jesus Christ did, in whose name we pray. Amen.